Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, last couple of people coming in, please uh, make your way to your seats and sit down. We're going to start this session. Thank you for arriving on time. I hope you enjoyed the lunch time and had a look at the exhibition and also uh, the tools room as well. Uh, a very interesting uh, resource and you can see all the things, the platforms and the tools that are available for you to help make cities more sustainable. For the next 90 minutes, we're going to be discussing session 4.1, which is looking at cities as actors of open innovation, accelerating sustainable urban transformation. And I think the word accelerating is pretty important here. Um, it's part of this week's Green City Summit Conference in Brussels. And I would also like to uh, extend a welcome as well as those of you in the room, also to those of you watching online via web streaming. My name is Aminda Lee. I'm a British journalist and broadcaster, ex-BBC, uh, now living and working out of Rome. I specialize in environmental topics, and I'm honored to be your moderator at this uh, session. It's actually my 11th year at Green Week, so uh, I'm a bit of an habitué, as they say. This session has been uh, jointly organized by the Executive Agency of the European Commission for SMEs, known as EASME for short, and by the Commission's Directorate General for Research and Innovation, DGRTD. And they are working together on innovating cities, and we're going to hear a little bit about that uh, during the session. I'm going to now explain how the 90 minutes is going to work, but before that, of course, we always have housekeeping. Um, interpretation is available in French on Channel 2, in German on Channel 3, and in English on Channel 1. And headsets are available just outside the room uh, if you need them. Though, uh, as far as I know, all our speakers are speaking in English, unless they're going to surprise me. Uh, <clears throat> so, you should be alright, but obviously if you want to ask questions, um, you can uh, get the headsets. Please, please do keep your mobiles on silent. Uh, you don't have to switch them off because we would like you to tweet if you're into Twitter. Uh, and the hashtag is EU Green Week. And of course, those of you watching online, you're free to tweet away as well. On the subject of technology, just so you know, in this session we're not going to be doing any particular polls uh, or asking questions via the Connects Me app. But you can still, of course, use it for networking. So this, week, this week's Green Week, this year's Green Week, is about sharing ideas and experiences on how to develop cities in a sustainable way. And we've heard this is quite a task. Cities have got huge challenges ahead of them. Air quality, noise, waste, water management, and urban planning, to name but a few. And then clearly, innovation is crucial for enabling and accelerating, that word again, urban transformation in our cities. In this session, we're going to start with a brief scene-setting introduction outlining the EU's research and innovation activities on innovating cities from one of the co-organizers of these discussions, Maria Yeroyani from DGRTD. That will be followed by two 10-minute scene-setter present, presentations where Jonas Byland from JPI Urban Europe will look at the food, water, energy nexus. Then we're going to hear from Joka Quintens from Moving Marseille, who is going to explore how social innovation can help encourage urban transformation. Then we're going to be having a tale not of two cities, but of three cities, with perspectives from Turkey, Finland and the Netherlands regarding three different Horizon 2020 projects run by the EU, which will give you a snapshot of what is already being achieved. Then we're going to have some debate, and there will be time for your questions as well. And then finally, to wrap us up, we're going to be hearing from the community of Latin American and Caribbean states perspective on Europe's research and innovation approach to sustainable urbanization. And that will be from Agostina Velo from Argentina's Ministry of Science, Technology and Productive Innovation. And finally, to wrap up the discussion, uh, we're going to hear from Hugo Guarnacci from EASME, 
who's going to draw some conclusions, emphasizing the relevance of Horizon 2020 in working for and with cities to help stimulate open innovation. So, without any further delay, I would like to now invite on stage Maria Yeroyani. Uh, she is a senior expert on innovating cities at DGRTD. And she's going to set the scene for the discussions to come, so please give her a warm welcome. Good morning, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'm going to try to be brief so that I leave enough time for this session. Uh, Horizon 2020 has invested more than 1.7 billion euro over the years 2014, 2018, and especially 405 million euro for smart and sustainable cities. So this shows the importance that we put on this subject, innovating cities. Uh, and the calls that we have launched, and they are ongoing, and you have all the information just out, outside of the room on uh, the booklet uh, EU investments, EU for cities and with cities. So you have a mapping of what we have done in the Commission for the cities, and not only in uh, RTD, but all the research family of cities uh, activities. Uh, so, the calls that we have launched this Climate and Resilient Cities 2016, then there is the Inclusive Urban Regeneration Demonstration Projects in the order each project of 10, between 10 million, 15 million euro, and a very big consortium of participants for the first time having municipalities as partners in the projects. Then, we are now evaluating a call on Circular Cities, 2018 call, and 2019 we have the Healthy Cities. Uh, as you see from the calls and from the subjects, we support in the policy agenda of innovating cities a systemic and cross-sectorial approach. This means that we support solutions that combine technological, digital, social, cultural, uh, nature-based innovations, and we support nexus configurations, so like urban nexus, water, energy, health, etc. Uh, the novelty in this, so the aim is to address urban challenges in this cross-sectorial way, so break the silos, and so address all together in one package, uh, urban mobility, energy, water, waste management, resource efficiency, climate change, natural disasters, pollution, health, well-being, social cohesion, and social inclusion. Uh, and so this, the session, as you see, is a multi-stakeholder, uh, multi-benefit, multi-sectorial systemic approach session. The novelty in our policy agenda for innovating cities is that we are launching uh, strategic research, uh, uh, we are launching an expert group, high-level commission expert group on innovating cities. The aim is to help us formulate a visionary strategic research agenda to address all urban challenges in a systemic cross-sectorial way and to guide the EU investments uh, on innovation uh, for cities. And of course, the aim is to align this strategic research agenda the report will be received by April 2019, and to align our agenda on innovating cities with the strategic research agenda of joint, uh, joint programming uh, urban Europe, of the global covenant of mayors, and all uh, strategic agendas existing. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, thank you to set our scene. As you are all aware, cities are, of course, crucial if we want to create sustainable societies and lifestyles. More than half the world's population already lives in cities. Uh, I'm sure you've already been asked this before, but I would like to know um, who in this room does not live in a city. Put your hand up if you don't live in a city. Okay, we've got about three hands out of about... Uh, more than 100 people, so not very many. Okay, so we all live in cities. And of course, we know, the ones of us who do live in cities, uh, you lucky ones who don't, uh, don't have these problems, you have different problems, uh, 
you know, we live our lives there, but we can actually feel the pressures of climate change, of pollution, of natural disasters, of migration. Um, and those are just a few of the problems that we face. And we know that our cities are going to see huge change over the next 30 years, huge expansion, and that's going to put even more pressure on supplies of food, of our energy, and our water. And this is the issue that we're now going to hear about in our first scene setting, uh, from our first scene setting speaker, Jonas Byland. He's from the Joint, uh, Joint Program Programming Initiative, or JPI Urban Europe, which is a partly funded Horizon 2020 project. Jonas is an expert in human geography and social anthropology, and today he's going to tell us more about the Sustainable Urbanization Global Initiative, or SUGI. Uh, for the Italians in the room, that doesn't mean the thing you put on your pasta. <laughs> <clears throat> and he's going to look at the food, water, energy nexus, which is a call jointly established by the Belmont Forum and the JPI. Jonas Byland, please make your way to the stage, and the floor is now yours. Please give him a warm welcome while he's getting to the stage. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we talked about how to pronounce my name, and I'm, I'm kind of used to very different kinds of pronunciations. But my name is Jonas Bylund. <laughs> oh, okay. um, thank you for the introduction. And I, I was, uh, I am, as you can see by the, is it called the byline? I'm in the management board of JPI Urban Europe, so I have a governing board above me. Um, and I'm kind of working with research, research and innovation. That's kind of my task. But, but it's wide and it's more about networking and, and finding out what we should do in the program. So at the moment, I'm actually quite caught up in my head uh, in that we are foreseeing changes and updates that we have to do in our strategic research and innovation agenda. The current one runs up until 2020, and uh, the next update should then take on afterwards. But we are updating it now. Yes, we have to write it now, of course. So I'm very happy to hear about the alignment opportunities efforts with, with innovating cities, of course. Um, now let's see if this works. Right. Um, JPI Urban Europe is a member states initiative. We are keen to point out at times. Um, we are in happy partnership and cooperation with, with the uh, European Commission, first and foremost, and, but also with other parts of the world. So, but what this means as a member states initiative is that ministries and funding agencies in different countries come together and try to make a transnational program. Um, one of these activities is to launch calls for urban research and innovation. Um, and that's the one call that I'm kind of opening this, this little intervention around. That's the SUGI, the, the, the Sustainable Urbanization Global Initiative, together with the Belmont Forum and the Commission. Right? So that's kind of how these things look as a partnership. JPI Urban Europe, um, as a program, has put itself the task to, to be challenge-driven. That is, not just to tackle the challenge of, of urban development, contemporary urban development, but, but also to do it in a more of a challenge-driven way. That is, uh, not in a kind of linear way of having certain actors finding out what the problem is and then trying to work out developments that will be implemented somewhere down the line of, I don't know, kind of a Fordist situation, uh, but rather that different actors just come together and say, these are the challenges that we experience, let's together try to work out how we tackle it, how we perhaps solve it, but how we try to work towards better urban futures. Um, so again, it's more about pull dynamics than the, perhaps the older push, technical, technological push dimensions. Um, what we try to do in the SUGI call, uh, in the partnership with Belmont Forum, with the European Commission, uh, is to tackle 
the nexus uh, around or in or through food, water, and energy. Um, and to do that in, in a worldwide sense, that is, in urban settings around the globe. Um, this is because today, as yes, I was one of those who didn't quite raise my hand, I don't really live in a city as such. I live 100 kilometers outside kind of a dense urban area. On the other hand, to me, this is still very much living in an urban context. And I think in many parts of the world today, the kind of strict line between urban and what other ways of life there are, they, aren't, they are kind of blurred today. We have more of a planetary urban situation, perhaps. So these nexus, these different kinds of nexus, they, they are truly important, not just for the urban situation, but actually for the planetary situation. And you've probably heard some variants of this kind of um, argument before. Right? So we need to do this internationally, that is, in a worldwide sense, because on the one hand, we don't need to have different actors, or it would be pity if different actors uh, in their different kind of areas just reinvent the wheel, and perhaps it's better if they start talking to each other and exchange, right? This is perhaps common sense, but it's, uh, in the practice of it, it's not that easy in urban research and innovation. Um, but by this, we also want to shape a critical mass in a program setting, a kind of a family, the Suji call. Each of our calls are kind of families. The Suji is a specific uh, family situation that we try to create for the projects, for the actors who are working with the food, water, energy nexus. So a part of that is also in how we try to integrate between silos. Uh, or between sectors such as food, water, energy, in this case, right? So it's a framework for collaboration, a worldwide collaboration, um, and it's also because we think that these nexus approaches or similar kinds, the food, water, energy nexus, that was not the signal, thank you. <laughs> I got two slides left. Um, that this kind of approach, the nexus approach is pivotal we can say, to sustainable urbanization is, is a way of, if you get into this perspective, uh, you really have turning points in how you actually think about solutions or opportunities or how to think about dealing with it. Um, we fund, in this call, in the Suji context, we fund 15 projects. Um, and as you can see of the map, the collaborating countries. Uh, the green, the light green ones are the Belmont Forum connected countries, and the yellow one, no, yellow, sorry, the blue ones are the <laughs> ones connected through JPI Urban Europe. Um, we have 15 projects that came out of 188 proposals. So the, the, the Secretariat and the Review Committee, the, the kind of collaboration has made huge efforts in trying to shape uh, this <laughs> outcome. Um, worthy of mentioning is that seven of these projects work with uh, urban living lab approaches in different ways. But they're all intent on closing loops, shape interfaces between different sectors and different actors. Uh, to build knowledge platforms and better modeling around food, water, energy nexus. That is, working also with many city authorities and administrations. So, um, each of these projects have representatives from at least three different countries as well. So that's also worth mentioning. And with this family, with this Suji initiative, uh, there is also a um, kind of a stakeholder involvement initiative platform situation. So if you visit the, the website for it, you can also get in touch and see how you can connect to this if you want to. Um, now, what I was trying to do to try to say, set the scene and leaving the specific food, water, energy nexus a bit, but 
really thinking about urban nexus or nexi. I think that the proper Latin would be nexus still in the plural. I'm, I'm not sure about that. Sorry. My bad European. Don't ask me. Um, but we could think about it. One thing is the, what challenges our imagination at times, the kind of intersections and the strange um, dynamics when different sectors suddenly meet, right? <laughs> but you also have it uh, that it could be an interesting way of also thinking about dilemma-driven concepts. We know that it's sometimes not very fun to talk about the real conflicts, the real friction involved in the issues that we try to get research and innovation or different kinds of actors actually to tackle. Oh, that was a signal, right? So that's one thing that we're thinking about. Maybe Urban Nexus for this session, what if you think about it as a dilemma-driven or, or perhaps dilemma-friendly uh, uh, concept? We can think about, I see, for example, a lot of disagreement in urban settings today between different actors who think uh, have different interests in or ideas of what the urban should be about. And sometimes it means that they are actually talking to each other. Sometimes it means that there is a kind of a false understanding that they think they mean the same thing. So there, there's this different kinds of disagreements going on here, which nexus are good at articulating, I think. It's also, um, we can think about heaven and hell scenarios. Uh, how do we deal with that? And this is something that we are trying to process now uh, in our update. And maybe we can uh, talk more about that later on, because now I'm going to jump to how we think about, and this is uh, perhaps a preview of how we think about relating to the SDG 11 as, as one of the kind of primary parts. Um, important in what we see here in cities as actors in open innovation is one thing that we have started hearing a lot also on a European level is perhaps direct directionality. That it's not just uh, um, uh, sensible anymore to keep on programming in a kind of a wide throwing around different exciting projects, but we actually need something like SDG 11 to help us also align globally. And in our thinking, SDG 11 also opens up towards the other different SDGs, right? Uh, SDG 11, because of the sub-targets, also open to uh, ending poverty, for example, or uh, education, and so on. These other kinds of issues. So, uh, the other thing is that what, what we really see, and I think now I'm stretching it, um, is when we talk about cities as actors in open innovation, we also need to talk a lot about the kind of public administrative capacities to actually be part of innovation projects, be part of innovation development, be part of transitions, and actually be actors or leading transformations. And this is something that we are also putting a lot of stress around today, I think, or JPA Urban Europe is, at least, in and with the Urban Nexus approach. Thank you. Thank you. You'd forgotten you have to come and talk. <laughs> so you, you talked about families. You also talked about heaven and hell. I don't know whether they both go in the same... <laughs> um, but we all know that families don't always get on together. Um, so how do you manage to get everybody pulling in the same direction for the same type of goal, even if they're coming from different areas? Um. And I'm afraid that my answer will be a rock, perhaps a bit cliché, words. But, but um, one thing that I've learned uh, working in around urban sustainability, and it's just me, but I think we all perhaps sense this, that there are different ways where um, disagreement can also be very constructive, because that's when you start finding traction, finding things, trying to work out better ways of what you're doing. If we are doing it in a civilized manner, of course, there are always the, the dangers that we start being, let's say, destructive against each other. Um, 
I'm not sure how we do that. Researchers are quite good at doing that. That's kind of part of the core training for research. They always, they sit in seminars, they really try to bash each other. I think in, in policy discussions, we're not really that good at it. Um, and it has to do, of course, with, 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 with the civility of how you do policy. So, uh, and I think this is also reflected in many times when we have these kind of multi-actor, multi-stakeholder situations that you have very different ideas about what is civilized behavior, perhaps, even. Uh, so how we deal with that, yes, I'm not quite sure. We're just trying to build trust, perhaps, but not too much consensus. Okay, interesting. And, and can you just... I, I was quite curious, heaven, hell scenario sounds, uh, sounds very interesting, so I'm afraid I would like to ask you to tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, sorry. I showed an image that was kind of, a, as you m might have seen, you might recognize it as a typical event where you have, we have a facilitator that we love working with, and then you get these kinds of post-its and different interesting writings. Um, this was one way of trying to capture not just asking stakeholders, so what are the most pressing issues? But actually try to ask them, okay, so what are the dilemmas here? What, what are kind of things that are in conflict? And what are things that are really perhaps a bit more uncomfortable talking about? One way to lure that out was to talk about heaven and hell scenarios, perhaps, and, and talk about, so what do we have to do to deal with that? And what should we absolutely not do? and so on. And we had very many different kinds of um, issues and concerns around this, uh, where we also, of course, have to pick and choose a bit, and from there on shape an agenda that will build more on dilemmas rather than just issues, if, okay. if that makes sense. Yes. <laughs> But I mean, it sounds like it's quite a long, a long process, and not everybody is is, is used to doing this type of thing. So that, that's a challenge in itself, I suppose, to be able to even get to the point where you can then start talking about solutions. Well, I, I think we still talk about solutions, mm -hmm. and we can still talk about synergies or, or even consensus at times. It's just to be open to it, and I think that's where also, uh, let's say, thinking by the urban nexus and especially the food, water, energy nexus that has been very good to, to get people into that thinking. And we're still not, we, we still don't really have that kind of, we have a kind of a placeholder definition of it, but we don't really have a great understanding of how it actually works, particularly in different citizens and in different situations, mm. of course. So, but just to keep on pushing that kind of uh, friction areas, perhaps. Uh, it, I, we think it's worth it. And can you just give us a, a um, this is the last question, um, a couple of examples of these SUGI projects, what type of things are you, are you moving forward on? Oh, you got me there. <laughs> <laughs> now, we, we have a kickoff for the projects in, in June, and that's where I also hope to get to know them a lot better, so I could take this kind of question on a volley. But and um, as I mentioned, well, at least seven of them work with urban living labs, and that's a kind of that, that type of urban experimental approach is something that JPI Urban Europe is quite... We, we tend to deal a lot with that kind of approach, and I think that's, that will be really interesting in this. Can you just, I mean, oh. for people who don't know what they are, can you tell us what urban living labs are? Well, it's, it's one among many different... There, there are different ways of talking about this, but the kind of a labbing approach and not having the lab in a, in, the, in a kind of proper place and in a campus somewhere and research, but actually having places in the everyday life of many people, different kinds of actors, and uh, with a kind of collaborative approach, with a co-creative approach, really try to work out challenges and issues in situ, in the place where it occurs, kind of. Mm -hmm. or, but it could be a networked issue as well, but, but it's that kind of thinking that a lot of urban governance actually needs to be doing this, since almost all policy implementation is kind of hypothetical, probably. So it's always an experimental situation, in a sense. So why not just be open with it? Why not just be transparent with it? 
Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. I'm now, uh, you can now, <laughs> you're now free to go and sit back in the audience. And I'm now going to move on to our next speaker. There will be a chance for you to put your questions to Jonas afterwards as well. Um, so, spurring cities to become sustainable is not just about research, design, and implementation of innovative technologies. There are other ways to green our cities, including ones that we wouldn't necessarily expect, like social innovation. And this is the sphere of our next speaker, um, where she's a complete expert. Yuka Quintens has experience in politics as deputy mayor of the city of Genk in, Genk in Belgium. And she's now based in the French city of Marseille. In Living Lab Moving Marseille project, Yuka uses the city as a lab to learn, but also to connect people and projects in and with Marseille. Today, if you want to start making your way up to the stage, uh, today she's going to talk to us about Weetopia, making cities together through social innovation. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you, Amanda. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Joke Quintens. I know it pronounces also, and it's odd when you read it, I know. Uh, and uh, I come back to who I am and what I do in my story. But um, yeah, we're at Cities as Actors of Open Innovation, Accelerating Sustainable Urban Transformation. And I want to address the following uh, question. How can cities accelerate sustainable urban transformation through social innovation? And uh, my answer yeah, is very clear on that, by making cities together from the bottom up, I think, by shaping Witopia. And what's Witopia? Witopia is a word um, I invented uh, to explain how we can take action to build our community together. So civilians, activists, artists, scientists, entrepreneurs, civil servants, and of course also policymakers. When people have little faith, let's say, in the top down of things, it's necessary that we try to reshape our society together. And we all know in this room that in the meanwhile, uh, people are already constructing uh, Utopia. When you want transitions to work and systems to change, everybody has to be involved. Not only scientists and policymakers with their administrations, but everybody has to uh, uh, take care or can take uh, responsibilities to accelerate transitions. And in Utopia, we see things like new alliances, also without government, without local government. A lot of regained pride and self-esteem uh, and the strength, and that's important, I think, of the super diverse community as main characteristics. And I want to tell you a bit of a personal story to explain uh, what I mean with this. So, um, I'm... Uh, an historian, graduated in uh, migration history, and I started my career as a community worker in very mixed uh, and also very deprived uh, neighborhoods in Brussels and Antwerp, and uh, tried to strengthen people in their talents in what they're good at. And then I decided to become a freelancer, an entrepreneur, to facilitate organizations and uh, cities in societal change. I got, shit happens sometimes, <laughs> I got involved in, uh, in policy making, participated at local elections, and I became, as you said, uh, deputy mayor of the city of Genk uh, in Flanders in Belgium. And I developed from that role a lot of projects together, of course, with civil servants, with associations, but most important with citizens about sustainable urban development in all, uh, again, the context, a working class city and uh, a super diverse city. And today I live in Marseille, another super diverse city. You could say the most African city also of Europe and focus on social design as an active citizen, but also as a professional. And I set up a living lab, an urban lab to research how super diversity can accelerate uh, a city. And I organize also urban field trips on social innovation uh, from the bottom up. 
And what uh, do we always um, what do we always want? We as engaged people, we want, I think, impact. We ask ourselves all the time, how can we change things uh, for the better in every role? And uh, I must say, you can't do this alone. To me, it's always about building bridges and focus on diversity as a strength. And in all those kinds of roles, from civil servant to scientist, from citizen to artist, we all can make a difference. And now I decided, uh, after almost 25 years, to do it more as a facilitator, as a matchmaker, helping people to make uh, this difference. And that's what I do with uh, Moving Marseille. So I think it's all about matchmaking, about twinning people, all about enabling people to learn, to get inspired, inspired to, to be able to copy things, to experiment, to collaborate. And of course, just do it together. And that's why I want to share three really interesting examples of social innovation from Marseille who inspire me a lot. And always keep the context in mind. Marseille is a very unequal city. It's a super diverse city. It's a popular working class city. And important too, uh, uh, the, the government is rather, to my opinion, absent, and therefore there is a very activistic basis, a very activistic uh, um, yeah, social field, let's say. And the first uh, example is uh, Bernard Dubois, Le Lab Zero, it's uh, social innovation, accelerating sustainable uh, uh, transformation. And Bernard Dubois is, uh, is just the name of a street, they don't have a name yet, I must say. But uh, um, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a, a copy, and then we're talking uh, about disseminating things, a copy of Les Grands Voisins in, uh, in Paris. Uh, it's the same people who are working on that. It's an empty, temporary, and legally occupied building from the national government as a hotspot to accommodate homeless uh, people and to set up a new ecosystem with lots of partners to do, uh, to do this in a very different way. Then we're talking about innovation. And Lab Zero is the laboratory of social innovation piloted by the uh, Prefecture, so the national government. And Marseille Solution, an, an, uh, a civil society project, works with Lab Zero to experiment solutions for social issues and intervenes in Bernard Dubois on the question in French, we say zero non recours au droit, so using their rights uh, they have. Yes, we camp, uh, an, an, um, a group of activists uh, uh, is in charge of the project and co pilots it with Group SOS, who is in charge with the uh, accommodation center. And Plateau Urbain rents the space for our activities. Also, are involved Belsens, uh, that's the neighborhood, social and cultural actors like so, so, uh, social centers, uh, cultural uh, a theater, a music. Uh, uh, hall and so on. And uh, they work with residents, especially on the green aspects. For, for instance, on the roof of the building, the inhabitants, so the homeless people, will cultivate green and once plants disseminate this to the inhabitants of the neighborhood to green their streets even more than many in the neighborhood already do. And uh, they want to set up a structure with 50 uh, partners to work on the site. So companies, startups, and the only thing they want in return is to do something for the target group, for the, for the uh, homeless people. A second uh, uh, social innovation I wanted to show is Parc Foresta. It was a not uh, used piece of land uh, on for the site strategic hill of Marseille. You see the Hollywood letters, the Marseille letters. Uh, and it's owned by a company, this, uh, this space, and it's called, uh, the company is called Resilience. And they invited the activists of Yes We Camp to use for at least eight years uh, this piece of land. It's 20 hectares, so 50 acres of land, and to do something attractive with it. And they decided to make a metropolitan park for everybody. 
And in Forestal also, again, the same story about Weetopia. Several kind of partners are involved. Apart from Yes, We Can Resilience, there are, there are some local associations dedicated to sport, culture, craft, four community centers, because Foresta is at the convergence of, of uh, many priority areas, uh, a cooperative of residents, Hotel du Nord, some artists, urbanists, and so on. So, second, and then I go to my last uh, uh, example about social innovation, um, working on the talents of the super diverse community. And in Marseille, again, when people just wait that something happens, it comes from the bottom up, and in this case, from companies. So companies take action to take their part of initiating projects and taking responsibility. And I give just one example, because my time is almost up. Sylvie Bansillon, a very exciting lady, uh, she's uh, the leading lady of Table de Cana, an, uh, um, a catering firm, and she set up together with innovation partner Marseille Solution a project called Des Etoiles et des Femmes, in which every nine months a woman with lots of cooking talents from a deprived neighborhood can do an internship with a star chef. And you, I, I don't have to explain to you that uh, for those women, their lives uh, changes completely. I go to my next slide. <laughs> And uh, I wanted to end uh, my story with some uh, strategies to accelerate sustainable urban transformation. But maybe I must say attitudes. Maybe it's more about attitudes than uh, about the real strategy. And I should say, look with new and different eyes. Uh, make new and different alliances. Uh, use that new and different energy. Experiment disseminate good things, like the, the example of Bernard Dubois. Temporary is also sustainable. I, I really think that temporary projects are good. Use the diversity. Uh, the motto of Marseille Solution is see it big, start small, and go fast. Accelerate optimism, don't wait, act now, and do it together. Thank you. I don't know about you, but I certainly feel that you're very good at accelerating optimism. It's full of incredible enthusiasm, um, which, which could be an advantage and could be a disadvantage, in that policymakers tend to be quite uh, conservative, perhaps, and, and your vision is perhaps a little bit strong for them or too much for them to understand, or they think it's a weetopia and not the real world. So uh, maybe I exaggerated a bit, little bit about politicians and when I'm in... Uh, uh, when you ask that question to me, I will always defend politicians. <laughs> I, I was one myself and uh, I think uh, politician are, uh, politicians, local politicians, are really key to uh, change cities. So, uh, and when there is uh, some kind of absence or, yeah, I, I dare to say in Marseille, kind of clientelistic uh, uh, practice, yeah, okay, then, then you need some alternative. Uh, but I think there, um, and probably there are a lot in, in this room too, I think uh, uh, politicians can really uh, be the key in it. And, and, and the best ways is working together. Because in Utopia, politicians, civil servants, are part of Utopia, of course. It's not about activists against politicians, it's about doing things together to change a city, I think. You also talked about cultural diversity, um, something that perhaps sometimes we see in quite a negative way. Well, how can we overcome that to, to, make, to see cultural diversity as something that is positive and, and, and then harness that? Yeah, I should say visit Genk and Marseille. <laughs> You're welcome to, to, to see this. Yeah, I always believed, but, but I worked uh, in two cities, although they are from a very different scale, of course, uh, and, and one in the north of northern Europe and the, the other one in southern Europe. But uh, I'm really convinced that uh, um, the, a diverse uh, community is a strength. It adds something. Uh, 
uh, also on, on the greening, I, uh, we, we um, uh, together with the citizens, with the, with the, uh, the citizens from very diverse ethnic, ethnic cultural uh, background, uh, maybe we uh, choose, chose other options to, to work on nature-based solutions, for instance, in the city. So um, I think the rich uh, diversity is, is certainly a strength. I, I give one example. For example, uh, we, we had uh, a huge um, community of Italians and Turkish people, for example, in Genk. Uh, uh, and together, with, they were really specialists when it came to growing vegetables, uh, cook and work with honey, uh, uh, to uh, do things in um, people who like to live uh, outside and do things in, in a common space, like we Belgians were more like uh, behind the curtains. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, it, it's really, it, it, it adds a lot more than, than it's a problem, but that's, that's also an attitude. That's uh, the way you want to look at the world, I mm -hmm. think. I also found it interesting, uh, you were talking about everyone getting together. Sometimes you can have a local authority that is very too present, and then sometimes you can have one that is too absent. But you don't see that as a problem necessarily. No, I think um, because Genk and Marseille are good examples because uh, uh, Genk. I always said in Genk, even the bottom up is organized top down. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, so um, some municipalities are very good in over organizing things for the people and not uh, d uh, letting them do it by themselves, uh, but. Um, uh, a lot of work can be done, of course, and, and uh, uh, as you uh, focus on, on good uh, participation uh, processes and so on. But I don't think it's necessary the big problem in Marseille. Of course, I hope in two years there will, will be uh, a mayor elected who, uh, and, and, and a group of people, politicians, uh, who will uh, really put Marseille on the European map. Of course, I, I hope so. But in the meantime, people are uh, already constructing Utopia. So, uh, so uh, life goes on, I should say. I found it very interesting that you were saying that private companies mm -hmm. were getting involved almost of their own volition. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that's... Yeah, it's, an, it's amazing. Another example for, uh, is um, uh, a, a pharma company. Christophe is the head of a pharma company. And you, uh, you must know in, uh, in France, 14-year-old children, so third class, they all have to do uh, a, an internship. So uh, they are ch children, so they can't work, but just to, to watch how uh, uh, things work in a company. But of course, uh, the youngsters from deprived neighborhoods who don't have a network uh, find it very hard. So sometimes they just can do their internship in a snack bar uh, around the corner and that's everything. So it doesn't help them, them uh, a lot. And this guy who has uh, a, a, a small f uh, firm of pharma, in one of those, uh, uh, at the border of one of those uh, uh, neighborhoods, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling very sad about this, so I'm going to do something about it. I want to help these guys. And in the first year, he um, convinced 60 colleagues to uh, provide internships. Now, uh, in the third year, in 2018, they set their goal for 500 internships. In, I, I don't say 500 companies, but 500 uh, children will be helped. So th this is a very, th th this is very, um, this is social innovation for me, and uh, done by companies. Th there is also, for example, a, a bank, a local bank, uh, f and they find, uh, um, in the sport clubs of the neighborhood, they go to find uh, the advisors to work for the bank because they say they, they are very good in, in uh, uh, competition, they, they, they can work together. So, so uh, young people who play football or rugby or, or whatever, who never would work in a bank, work now in a bank because this uh, small bank goes to find them in the sport clubs of deprived neighborhoods. So I think it's amazing what, what, uh, what uh, enterprise prices do in Marseille on that. I, I don't say everybody, but there are very good examples, yes. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.
There will be opportunity to ask questions later on as well, so please do save them up. Uh, I would now like to call up our three cities that we're going to focus on, uh, if you'd like to come up on stage. And um, uh, what I'm going to do is we're going to hear from these three cities who are involved in Horizon 2020 projects for innovation in the field of sustainable urbanization. And first up, if you want to go straight to the... Uh, yeah, uh-huh. Um, we have, and I'm not going to pronounce it the way that I should do, is Izmir. I know it's Izmir, Izmir? Izmir. Izmir. Uh, it's a Turkish city with 4.2 million inhabitants, and it's 3,000 kilometers away from where we are today. Anyone been to Izmir? Hands up. Okay. Well, um, it seems like it's changing quite a lot in Izmir, so you need to go back and see the changes. Um, it's one of three demonstrator cities of the Horizon 2020 proje project Urban Green Up. This project aims to contribute to the mitigation of climate change risks in cities, increase the resilience to climate change effects, and also improve air quality. And to tell us more about this, in a change to our build speaker, um, we are now going to hear from Kore Velibeliogu. He is an associate professor of the Department of Urban and Regional Planning within Izmir Institute of Technology, and he's a member of the Urban Green Up project. Please give him a good round of applause. Thank you, Aminda, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure for me to uh, to tell you about the progress about uh, the Horizon 2020 projects. Uh, I'm a member of the uh, Urban Green Up project uh, from the city of Izmir. Uh, this Urban Green Up project uh, aims to uh, developing, applying, and validating a methodology uh, to renaturing urban plants to mitigate the impacts of the climate change. So you will see in the slides the current situation in Izmir. There's a stark difference between urban and natural areas. As Aminda says, the city has the population of 4.2 million people lives here. And it is estimated that in uh, 2050, it will be goes up to 8 million. So uh, the sprawling city, the urban expansion is still continue, so we need to cope with this through the nature-based solutions and innovations. So next slide, please. You oh. should, there should be a okay. clicker. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, here you see our methodology uh, for, the, for the urban green up. You will see the dense urban centers to the natural areas. There is some character zones between them. Uh, it's not a buffering strategy, of course. Uh, it tries to uh, create a continuum between urban and nature. And then uh, the demo size here placed both in dense urban areas, rural areas, and of course the general urban areas. Now, in dense urban areas, uh, our solution is to uh, is to create some uh, open spaces, convert them into, uh, into a green spaces by using the vertical uh, green infrastructure elements like this and uh, to, uh, to abate the uh, heat island effect for the cities. Uh, I mean the cooling the cities is the first priority for this vertical green infrastructure here. And uh, the other strategy for the urban center is uh, there are two de demo sites you will see in the, in the red uh, rectangles. Here there, uh, there is a small pocket park there. So uh, the aim is to convert the car parking areas into a small pocket park and then uh, create a network of smaller green public spaces and parks. Of course, the aim is also to abate the uh, heat island effect, so cooling the cities also, and uh, create a social 
you know, the social cohesion between the citizens, especially uh, this site is based, uh, located on the shopping street, so it creates also the social interaction between the people. So, uh, other project area, this is in the, not in the dance urban center, but it is still in the general uh, dance urban area, uh, the, the other character zone. Here you see the urban river, uh, it's open to the coastline. Uh, there's in the coastline, but in, not in that picture you, you, you couldn't see, but uh, there's a gulf there, so uh, the aim is to create a green corridor to, to against uh, to uh, manage management of the water. So, this green corridor reached to this uh, natural life park. In the life park, there are other two, the last two slides. Uh, in the natural life park, we have a two special uh, district there. The one is here, you see in the picture, the Climate Smart Urban Farming Precinct. This precinct uh, aim is to uh, meet uh, urban people, the city of people of Izmir, to meet the urban farming opportunities created here. And the last one is for educational purposes. It's, it's actually an educational path. We call this, we called this Bio Boulevard. This Bio Boulevard aims to, uh, to collect all of the nature-based solutions and uh, to educate people in terms of diversity and the effects of climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Our next story comes from the city of Tampere in southern Finland. It has almost 250,000 inhabitants, so, and there's also half a million in the whole region. Slightly different scenario to Izmir. Um, and as we were saying on the phone, you were saying that if climate change predictions are correct, the whole of Finland could see a 25% increase in rainfall, uh, which clearly, clearly poses big problems. Um, so to start to find ways to uh, cope with this future, uh, the city of Tampere has become involved in the Unilab, or Urban Nature Labs project, and again, that's funded by Horizon 2020. And to explain a little bit more about this, we have Suvi Holmer, who is working on the project. Please give her a round of applause. Hello, everyone. I'm telling you about Finland. It's a country with only a few people, but lots of forests and 100,000 lakes. But the climate change is causing problems for us too. As you heard, the rainfall will increase by 25%. And we have eight months when nothing is growing and the ground can be frozen about one meter deep for months. The cities in Finland are growing more rapidly than ever. Here you can see a photo of the, one of the living labs we are having in Judalab project in Tampere. And you can see the grey area. It was constructed about one, uh, 10 to 15 years ago. It's part of the city and it's still growing. And all this grey area was once forest land but now it's only covered with asphalt street and buildings. Fortunately, already then, back 10 to 15 years ago, we knew that we were facing problem, problems with the stormwater. And we built the largest nature-based uh, nature stormwater system in the Nordic countries but it was designed when there was nobody living in that area, and now we have to renew it. Uh, the other living lab area of the project we are using is an old uh, pulp and paper mill site just near the city centre. Now the city is making plans and only some activities are happening in the area. But in the future, 25,000 people will be living at that site. 
We have started co-creation processes with both sides, with all the main st stakeholders. And almost all the stakeholders are not experts in nature-based solutions. We have organized workshops and guided tools for the people and explained them what kind of uh, problems the nature-based solutions can, uh, can provide. And in that already existing area, also the school children have been participating in the processes. All the school children participated workshops and they were very interested in finding new solutions from their point of view. The youngest ones are not able to write their own ideas, but they are experts when finding right tools for them, innovative tools like Legos, and they can, they can tell what they want for the future. The school children have also a very important role when we are developing the already existing nature-based stormwater system, and the children will be monitoring the water quality and the insects in the future and studying their findings with the microscopes at the schools. We need cost-effective nature-based stormwater systems that can be maintained also in the winter when everything is frozen. But they can serve other purposes too. And we've been uh, asking the people what type of uh, services they, they are looking for. And the main findings so far are like they like to have swimming places, they like to get more walking paths, horse riding routes, more biodiversity, like insect hotels. And the children want, especially the children want green roof for their new school. And in the future, we like to see that the uh, uh, nature-based solutions work as they were meant to work. So we have technical devices measuring the, the storm water uh, qualities and the water flow. And already in the beginning, uh, some of the private properties have had uh, nature-based solutions on their plots, but not enough. Now we are in the, in the Unilab project, we are engaging the private property owners. And we are, uh, and the private property owners can apply for a certain money, innovative voucher, and with that money they can they can plan and construct nature-based uh, systems in their yards, parking lots, or on, on top of the, the building roofs. I think I'm going to have to, if we could just one, do it. One so, more. One more. Okay. Okay, you. sorry. Uh, and one, one more uh, innovative uh, uh, thing we are, we are experimenting is on that brownfield side. There is local universities piloting nutrient recovery from human urine, and the human urine is collected at summer festivals at the site. And the urine uh, is for growing algae, and the algae can be used for many purposes. So this might be a solution for the future. Thank you very much indeed. I'm glad we actually heard that. <laughs> In fact, I was in Pompeii recently and, uh, and they had a system where they collected it and paid for it as well because it was good for making clothes. And yeah, so there you are. Okay, um, and now it's time for our final city story. Uh, this time we're going to be focusing on Amsterdam, capital of the Netherlands, home to 850,000 people. So probably the middle city of the three that we have here. Um, it's the setting for the Horizon 2020 project, Click which is short for Circular Models Levering Invested Investments in Cultural Heritage. Uh, 
Here to tell us more, we have Charlotte Chance from the Parques de Sigua Foundation uh, in Amsterdam, and she's heavily involved in the Click Project. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you, uh, Minda, and uh, welcome all. Uh, glad to have you here. Um, I will try to pronounce this, but nobody outside of the Netherlands uh, does it better than we do. Pakhuis is Weiger, but it's in a former warehouse. Uh, we are actually a refurbished uh, warehouse in the, on the waterfront of the city of Amsterdam in an area where everything was demolished, but our building was squatted throughout the 80s, and now it is uh, home to a platform for social innovation in urban development. And I will briefly reflect only on the activities that we do to work towards sustainable urban development in our uh, uh, organization. And we are a proud partner of the Click Project that is about uh, leveraging investments in uh, cultural heritage adaptive reuse, in which we are uh, a best practice case on the one hand, which I will show you a bit about, but we're also an ecosystem partner. Uh, as I said, we refurbished this warehouse about 19 years ago when we had the technologies back then that were less advanced as today. But up until today, we tried to create as uh, sustainable as possible solutions. So we uh, now today run on uh, solar panels entirely. And we also work to sustain our um, energy efficiency within the building and the installations. Um, but our mo main focus is on uh, event organization. So we or organize over 600 events and we connect over 140,000 uh, participants, stakeholders to uh, uh, urban issues yearly. And um, we do this in the field of creative industries on the one hand and urban development on the other. And within that field of urban development, we do a lot uh, within circular cities, water resource efficiency, etc. everything that was mentioned here today, climate adaptation. And um, we, we bring stakeholders together in order to co-create solutions to those urban issues being raised. And this is, for example, a picture on, uh, of a recent event where we invited the key staff of a Shell Oil Company together with a highly inspirational initiative called Follow This that actually uh, gathers um, a lot of people to buy shares of Shell to actually change the system from within. So they're pressuring the, the shareholders meeting uh, by buying shares and becoming a stakeholder themselves. Uh, this is Fab City, something that we created in 2016. It's, a, it's an entirely self-sufficient campus of 40 pavilions, showcasing uh, different urban innovations from the Tesla Powerwall to tiny houses to um, 3D printers, uh, printing of repurposed concrete, etc. Uh, this was something that was part of our arts and design program during the, the presidency of the European Union that we had in the Netherlands. And now we are a proud partner of the Click project. Um, in which we, as I said, we are a best practice partner because we are a repurposed cultural heritage building that actually works to sustain the city. We work together with the city of Amsterdam to actually connect the agendas of cultural, of a circular economy on the one hand and uh, adaptive reuse on the other because up until today in the circular economy strategy of the city of Amsterdam, it's not needed to work on heritage buildings as well because it's, as uh, I was trying to mention before, it's incredibly difficult, of course, to make them energy efficient. So now next week we have our first uh, historic urban landscape workshop and we are really happy to have all stakeholders uh, across sectors together to actually work because this, the project just started. So uh, we are very excited to actually work on circular business models uh, to increase the uh, investments in, uh, in heritage adaptive reuse. And one of the other things that we're working towards, just the last thing to mention, is that we make the City Festival the end of June, uh, which is the result of Amsterdam winning the Innovation Capital of Europe Award in 2016, of which we were a proud partner as well. And we did the bid not only with the City of Amsterdam, but with uh, several partners throughout the city, uh, amongst us, uh, among them ourselves. And I think it was very interesting that the European Commission actually granted us the award because we weren't turning in a bit just on the basis of a technological innovation, but on an urban innovation ecosystem. And the fact that we actually work together uh, to sustain the city and to improve uh, urban innovation altogether. So if you're interested, join us in June and you'll be seeing one of the largest uh, festivals on urban innovation in Europe, supposedly. Thank you. Yeah. Could I call the other two speakers up onto the stage? And we're now going to uh, basically open up the floor to questions. Um, we have microphones around, hopefully, with people to bring microphones. I don't know. You can see mad dashing of finding microphones. Um, and 
when the microphone puts your hat, put your hand up and the microphone uh, comes to you. Uh, please tell us your name, your position. And obviously, if you're um, uh, talking to us, it means that you're okay about being web streamed around the world. Uh, okay, so give them a good smile. Uh, so we have one question here. Any other questions at the moment? Just pop your hand up. Okay, well, we'll start with you, and by the time uh, you've finished your question, then perhaps someone else will uh, have another one. And uh, please tell us who you are. My name is Andras Laszlo. I was born in Budapest, so I'm CEO of my own company, globalvisionsharing.net. I have a very easy question to all of you. You mentioned in your intro, twice the world accelerating, stressed the world. Uh, we are living in very critical times, and time is running out. Uh, the, my, my question is, why is it so difficult to work together? <laughs> Gosh. All right, I think we could probably have a, <clears throat> a university course on that or something. <laughs> right, we, we have microphones. I don't know who quite wants to start off with it. Well, I, you were talking about working together, so maybe okay. you can start off there. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a, pr <laughs> uh, a difficult one, but I think... Um, I, I should uh, po uh, answer with another question. Um, why uh, uh, are, aren't we focusing on uh, people who want to work together? And, 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 and that was also a bit of my message. Um, just do it from um, a common uh, feeling of we want to change something. So, yeah, of course, uh, there are a lot of maybe uh, people or institutions uh, who think it's difficult to work together with a certain partner, but I think there are a lot more who, who really work very good together on the field, so that's my opinion. Jonas? Yes, I, 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 I was tempted to start trying to give a theoretical answer. Like <laughs> I've seen planning studies and, and kind of urban studies research and so on, but I wonder if it, I mean, in an ideal world, uh, those that work together and, and shape something that is better than we have now, that should then kind of compete out the bad thing. But since the world isn't ideal in that sense, and that there are lots of vested interests in different ways, that shapes a lot of mistrust as well, because you, you, you fear for your kind of daily situation, survival perhaps. So we have lots of these dynamics also kind of inhibiting perhaps collaborations in different ways. I, I, I sincerely believe trust is one of the bigger things, but it shouldn't just be a kind of a religious experience of trust, but actually how do we shape it? And I think Joki and the other uh, uh, examples we've ever seen are, are kind of also pointing in that direction perhaps. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it's a highly, uh, it's, a, it's a very relevant question, but it's completely related to governance and democracy almost, because it is the way that you organize the collaboration that actually works. So uh, what we try to do in our organization, but I think I see it increasingly in, in other organizations as well, is to start from some sort of a common denominator, because you can't disagree on wanting to have a livable city or a greener city or a better world or more equitable. So if you start from that, it's sometimes easier to overcome those differences uh, if once you start focusing on what you have in common and then explore the differences. The example I gave you from the Shell company, they, they know, but they've been waiting for that moment for, for people to start pushing buttons that actually forces them to, to make that transition. And it is um, something that I think if you organize it well, also on a country or a city scale, it can actually work very well, but it's a governance question. Anyone else want to add anything? No? Okay. Uh, we have a gentleman in the, in the middle. I, oh, was it a lady? Oh, I, I think it was... <laughs> Gosh, there was yes. someone in a white shirt behind you who I, maybe he was pointing at you. Okay, all right. <laughs> Please, <laughs> tell us who you are. Helena Alegre from Portugal, from the National Civil Engineering Laboratory in Portugal. Uh, my question is the following. We, we were talking about uh, uh, acceleration, sustainable urban uh, uh, transformation, about innovation. So, of course, uh, creating awareness and... Uh, uh, engaging the population, engaging society, and be creative are fundamental issues to, to, to do that. 
but um, uh, there are also other critical is uh, problems such as uh, they were raised just just, just now that, that have to be with governance with uh, how can you build so if you have innovative solutions you need to be also created in terms of, of the governance uh, roles responsibilities who is going uh, how these new solutions are going to be themselves sustainable are they going to be maintained? How do you manage transition between what you have now and the future? If you don't think about that from scratch, they, won't be, uh, they may appear innovative and, and sustainable, but at the end they are not. So my question is, in the several examples that were shown, uh, is this type of problematic being uh, dealt with or not? Thank you. Anyone else uh, have a question to add at the moment? <coughs> Okay, all right. The, this is a key question, I think, you know, because we in introduce all these projects and then perhaps we forget to maintain them. Um, is that built in? I mean, uh, uh, how, is that, how does that work in Izmir? Uh, let me start uh, with the, uh, you know, the bottom-up processes. We always prefer the lab approach, for example, or social innovation is uh, worth to consider, but... Uh, in, in such a big city like Izmir, it's, it's hard to, you know, building trust between different groups. So uh, first, we need to uh, we need to refine or we need to test the approach first. For example, the proof of concept approach uh, we we would like to introduce in Izmir. This approach is works like this: pilot, test, refine, test, and if it if it works and scaling up. So uh, the demo sites for Izmir means like that. It's, it's like a you know, the, the pilot and if it works, it will be uh, going to a further stages. So uh, in terms of urban planning uh, uh, for, a, for a large city, uh, the most of the European cities is you know, the medium, medium size, but in in big cities like Izmir, it's a Mediterranean city also. Uh, it is uh, very different from the Asian counterparts, for example. The Seoul, for example, I think the city has uh, 8 million population lives there, so uh, they also want to be manage the growth. The managing urban growth is, uh, is the, I think, the biggest challenge for, for, for the city like Izmir. So, uh, we need to we need to combine the uh, or or reduce the you know dichotomy between the urban and nature. So uh, as I told you in the presentation, but one of the strategies is to create a continuum between them. But the further stage could be from uh, definitely it will start uh, from the nature-based solutions, but. It could be followed by the nature-based innovation, and then ultimately to go to nature-based living. It should be go to the ultimate aim, but uh, to to reach this aim, uh, it's probably uh, to create to use all of the options from urban planning, social innovation, everything we have. So, so we need this because we need to reverse the uh, effects of the you know, the hazardous effects of the mm. urbanization. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is still valid, as Jonas said. It's okay. a planetary phenomenon. And so uh, we need to cope with this by changing the mindset first. The, uh, so we, we, uh, we I, need to go to uh, nature-based living, I think. Okay, thank you. What about maintenance in your projects? Is that built in and, and how does that work? Yes, we, we have started with the co-creation and we are now at the phase of co-designing, but we will go further to the uh, co-maintaining also the uh, nature-based solutions. So we'll try to get the people involved in all the stages, all the life cycle of, of the solutions. And like in the uh, one example I told you about the school children, when they are involved monitoring the results, so they will tell the stories all, also at their homes, so the parents will get involved in, the, in, the, in, in taking care of the neighborhood. So we think 
very much that the people, the local people are the key solutions, keeping the, their environment in good condition. Okay, last word, anyone? Yeah, just just one short comment. Yeah. Uh, basically, on the on the new framework of the Horizon 2020 project, I think the the responsible research and innovation framework al already sort of uh, uh, allows for a better sustainability of these projects. Because I I represent an NGO company in our project. There's also three cities on board. There's academic institutions. There's a company, and I think this multi-stakeholder approach within the research projects also already allows that with the solutions that are created by the research partners, the the city partners and the NGO partners are re really the ones that actually go to work with those solutions. So I think it's increasingly entering the, the projects that we run. Okay, one last word, a sentence, and then we yes, have to um, move on. Uh, I, want, I wanted to, because the question was um, uh, about the sustainability of projects, and I think uh, that's what I mentioned before too, something temporary, like a project, uh, uh, can be sustainable too, because it can change mindsets, it can change attitudes of people. So you're working on something sustainable. So I, I think sometimes it's good to, to, to have temporary projects. Very unusual view, and, and don't often hear that. But uh, yes, it's interesting that they have benefits as well. Okay, uh, thank you. Since there are no more questions, um, I'm afraid uh, it, you should have put your hand up earlier because we're now unfortunately arriving towards the end. Uh, and talking about working together, uh, we're now going to hear about uh, what the community of Latin American and Caribbean states thinks of the EU's research and innovation approach in this sphere. Um, it's actually very important because uh, select countries were actually already involved in some of the EU Horizon 2020 20 projects we've been hearing about this afternoon. Uh, Urban Greenup, where the Colombian city of Medellin is a follower city, and in Unilab project, where the network of Brazilian intelligence cities are observers. So to give us a short reflection on this, uh, I'd like to now call up on stage Augusta Velo, Augustina Velo, from Argentina's Ministry of Science, Technology and Productive Innovation. Uh, I don't know whether you want to come sit here or over there. You're welcome when we're over there. Why not? Please give her a good welcome. So thank you very much to invite me, us, like Shuli, inviting the whole region to these uh, final reflections. I hope I can be as brief as I'm supposed to be. So, as uh, when I was introduced, our region is involved in many Horizon 2020 projects. Uh, also, Buenos Aires is involved as well in um, Unilab, so we are very much involved. And as funding agencies, we are also inv involved in Ensugi, so we are quite engaged in everything that has been presented. And so, as region, we have been we have acknowledged the sustainable urbanization as dialogue between both regions. That means that when we discuss regionally with the European Union, we have addressed the uh, topic as well. And we have set up a task force on sustainable urbanization. In fact, yesterday we have our discussion all together on regards on what topics should we address and why are we working all together. And of course, many of the themes and all the questions have been have been addressed also by us. I mean, uh, green solutions, how we address green solutions, what is the regional perspective among re uh, green solutions. And they have been also said about family. Family works together, but we also have disagreements. So we also try to put together a common denominator, which is, of course, difficult. And the Commission is supporting us. It, in fact, it has not been mentioned, but uh, the flagship initiative, there is a flagship initiative on sustainable urbanization, which requires the participation of select countries, select institutions, to be eligible in sustainable urbanization, which is interesting because we see the possibility of us, of the research institution, joining into this uh, topic. I wanted to... So, on regard to the next steps, uh, it had been also discussed ab about engagement, citizens and engagement. We have also seen that as a problem and to dis the discussion has also been yesterday around that topic. Um, and well, 
basically our next steps on our task, uh, task force on sustainable urbanization will be to define the, the common denominator on green solutions and how the region will address green solutions. And, well, afterwards, map and have a short um, mapping on how to, um, on what research institutions are working on the topic and how they, um, they can collaborate. Of course, we, yesterday we had our session and we have our, our presentation of uh, projects uh, that allow us to see that there are many projects implementing. So there are many implementation projects in the cities of, of different cities of the, of the country, which is what's very interesting as well. Um, so I think that's all for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. As, as you wish, since you've got your nameplate. So, we've covered a lot of ground in this session, um, and it's now time to draw a few conclusions. And to do that, I'm going to now ask Ayazmez Hugo Guarnacci, the joint organiser of this session, to come up on stage. Go behind me, why not? Um, and he's a project advisor at this EU agency for small and medium-sized businesses. And he's going to tell us where we're going forward from here. So first and foremost, good afternoon, everyone. It's a big pleasure to see such a big room quite full, which also highlight the interest in the session. And as an organizer, I think Maria and I are always kind of curious to see what came out from a session when you put that on paper and then you see realized in practice. I think I would like to thank all the speaker and Aminda for a great job because although we have an extensive panel, we are perfect on time, five to four for five minutes conclusion. So great thank you also to the speakers and to our professional moderator, which actually shows all their interest and professionalism in doing that. I would like to reflect upon the conclusion as a take home message of the session, not using my wording, because this is not my role, but using the word of the speakers. And in particular, focusing on three key words open, transformation, and we. Open cities, as cities are actors of open innovations. That was highlighted by both Jonas and Joke as uh, main speakers. So cities are actually participating as building a city ecosystem, where the entry point for this week on green cities was, of course, nature-based solutions, but not nature-based solution isolation. Nature-based solution, as Maria said at the very first beginning, at the intersection of different kind of innovation, digital, technological, and as important, social and cultural. And uh, of course, I think what is important from JPI Urban Europe perspective, which is a member state perspective, is to hear that not, not only they're interested in the critical mass, and therefore the top of the European Commission is justified to this scale up at the European level, but are also actually mirroring a bit of our approach in focusing on dilemma-driven approach. And I think that the dilemma is very interesting for us because our projects all demonstrated that by implying, putting together different stakeholders, it's not only about creating a success stories, it's also by mitigating the risk that comes from actually the conflict that emerge when you put different stake together, so stakeholders as a different actors operating in the city. Yoke was, as always, very powerful and actually um, colorful as well, not only in terms of hair, in sharing the point on social innovation and Weetopia, so the co-design. Lots of people tell us, oh, in all your calls in Horizon 2020 devoted to innovating city, you have this co-co-co, co-design, Co uh, creation and co implementation. And I think today all the different cities, including our pan from uh, Argentina, highlighted the importance of doing the co. So the we as a utopia in terms of joining forces across different geographic geographical areas, but also across different scenarios and regional landscapes. And I think I'm very grateful and proud as a project advisor working in ASME, dealing daily with uh, project management involving cities, that actually the three cities representative today highlighted uh, how important it is to start 
from the proposal stage in having a convincing proposal that put nature-based solution at the core of the urban planning. So related to the question, how do you keep him alive, the project remain alive because the cities that were winning our proposal were the one that most convincingly put as a front runner cities, this nature-based solution in the urban planning as the beginning. So it's not just doing it for having the European money, it's doing it as having an urban strategy. And I think that is the first key point. And both its mere as an associate country in Horizon 2020, with the um, project funded by the EU, but also Tempere put a lot of emphasis on education. So the we start also in between this intra uh, intergenerational approach, which is the core of sustainable urban development. And uh, I think what is also important that is mere highlighted is that you need to make space in the city, also, for example, space for water. So in order to mm. allocate uh, the water resilience for climate change, you need to actually reshape the urban planning. And Tempere, I think, was also very powerful in demonstrating how you can link nature-based solutions with sensor, for example, to measure water storage. And the example of nutrient recovery of human urine for, from cultural festival, it reminds us all that next time you need to have a look where you pee because you might be contributing to urban innovation, you never know. <laughs> And the last but not least example from Amsterdam, I think uh, it's another very sparring uh, uh, actually story that tells us what we're doing is really systemic because in our Horizon 2020 project on adaptive reuse, we're making the link between cultural heritage and natural based solutions. So that nature is not remaining in isolation, but it's also linked to social norm and cultural values. And adaptive reuse, as it was presented by the case in Amsterdam, is becoming core of the circular economy strategy of the city. So once again, we are trying to connect uh, through the city different policies agenda. And I think Amsterdam is also important to remind us that this link between nature-based solution and cultural heritage is important for what we define in our calls urban landscapes. So just to conclude, I think that it has been very exciting uh, to have your, your question and to have your inputs to actually demonstrating that we are not just creating a utopia, we are building towards uh, investing in Horizon 2020 a reality. A reality where indeed there are challenges, where indeed there are uh, several conflicts between different uh, actors, but this is a concrete happening. It's happening now, it's happening in several sister, in several, um, sister cities across Europe, making bridges uh, with associated countries like Turkey and going farther beyond the reaching CELAC uh, in Latin America. So thank you very much for making this happening and not just a utopia. Thank you. And on that rousing note, we've come to the end of the session and it's now time for a coffee break. Uh, the next session starts at 4.30. Um, don't forget to return your interpretation headsets if you had them. Uh, and, uh, and also, while you're in the, having a coffee, why not fill out the survey and give us feedback about what you think about this session, about Green Week in general. Uh, you can do it online as well, but since you're here, why not? do it in person. Uh, before you all head out, I would just on behalf of DG Environment and myself uh, like to thank all our panellists for sharing their expert knowledge and valuable experiences. Uh, thanks to the interpreters and to the technicians for helping us communicate. And thanks of course to this session's co-organisers uh, from DG RTD and EASME. Last but not least, thank you all for your concentrated listening and for watching online. Give yourselves a big round of applause. Gosh. <laughs>